That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Bros, the seventh film directed by <laughs> Nicholas Stoller, uh, which premiered at the 2022 Toronto International Film Festival and is being released uh, courtesy of, uh, it's Universal, right? Uh, September 30th, 2022. You know, I don't know. Uh, do I know any of Nicholas's other films? Yeah, uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Uh, with uh, Jason Siegel. Mm -hmm. uh, get, oh, and uh, who's Russell Brand? Kristen Bell. Uh, Kristen yeah, Bell. Also, Get Him to the Greek, uh, The Five Year Engagement. Oh, with P. Diddy. Uh, the, both of the Neighbors films. Uh, featuring oh, Zach Efron, with my Zac friend. Zach Efron. Okay. Uh, Who hurt his mouth. That's why he looks bad. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, that's all I can remember of. Uh, so, uh, so I, I'd be straight out the gate. I did not care for this movie. I know there are going to be nasty comments, but I did not like this movie. Yeah. We saw it at a, we saw a screening of it where there are a lot of homosexuals and there were a lot of people who seemed really into it. So I can imagine people will like it. Nothing's worse than when you're sitting in a film and everybody's laughing at the comedy and you're like, whoa, this is very broad. I will say there are many humorous moments. Sure. I think... I don't care for Billy Eichner at all, but I think if you take him out of the movie, which he's a big part of it, a lot of the supporting characters, a lot of the external, like peripheral comedy, I think works much better. Yeah, the devil that's in some of the details is quite funny, but the the central kind of, you know, cancer of the film is that this person that's never really allows himself to be likable. Well, I'm just going to say straight away, this movie to me, I, the reason I don't like it is I just... I already have to live around a bunch of gay, privileged white men who want to complain about their opportunities, of which they have many, and that's what this movie is. Like this delude, like like this gay white guy with a lot of privilege, who's sort of complaining that he had to work hard to get there, and then he doesn't have everything he wants, i.e., like a relationship. But, ugh. but and then he's not that appealing physically, and then but I, I, like gloms onto someone who is it just all feels like the same shit we see in every sort of like big city gay community that i don't like but i think if you resemble one of these people you probably would like this movie well I, which is what was in the audience I did. well i didn't really like <laughs> but i mean it. like basic gay white guys who are more concerned about their bodies and their floppy hair and hooking up but also wanting to build a life with someone and you know driving a certain car and having a I feel like that crowd probably would really find this movie funny. And then it does this thing that a lot of gay white men do, which is like sort of want to present as being very inclusive and like black lives matter and trans shit all over their Instagram and p pretending that they care. But then it's like, in reality, all your friends look just like you, you do all do the same shit. And then in this movie, the rub for me is it's trying to be very diverse. Like, Billy Eichner's character's friend group is like unbelievably diverse to the point where it's like, okay, like you're trying very hard, but his care, we can get into it. I, yes. I, I, <laughs> I think it's a, you know what it is a really good example of, uh, just because you say you're doing something doesn't mean you avoid the trap of doing it. Right. And, and kind of the, like it's, it, it's almost like if you have a friend that just chronically dates the wrong kind of people and does the same thing over and over again and you say, like, you point out to them that they're doing it and they do it anyway and it's like, well, well I'm going to watch my hands. Here, let's tell the basic story very quickly. It's pretty basic. Billy Eichner plays a guy named Bobby who's like a successful podcaster. Like, his, his career is going well. We see he lives in New York City, modern time. He has just taken a job as like the director of this new LGBTQ plus museum in New York City. So everything's going very well for him. He's very confident. Um, On the exterior. But he, and he's like one of those people who's like happily single. When one day he's out with a friend at a bar and sees this guy, like your standard, like hot muscle queen named Aaron or Andy? Aaron. Aaron, played by... Luke McFarlane, who's actually, uh, I'm not familiar with, with, was is notable for being a Hallmark leading man. Oh, really? Yes. That's funny because the Hallmark channel, which in this movie they call the Hall Heart channel, is kind of a big feature. I think feature. that's on purpose. And yeah. it's funny. Okay. So the bulk of the movie is these two. It's just every sort of like, when you think of like big city gay guy, like all the stereotypes of dating and sex apps and all, all that is all present. And they, these two are sort of trying to figure out, like, are we actually dating? 
but everything culminates with Billy seeing Bobby making out with like an like a high school buddy who he has always had a crush on and then Billy's character gets upset like I know you don't find me attractive he keeps saying it throughout the movie like yeah. I know you don't find me attractive you only like these hot muscle white muscle queens which is ironic because Billy's character that's what you're also doing so he decides to break up with him and then quite a bit of time goes by when because the main storyline outside of the relationship is Billy's character trying to open this museum which he's able to do so by receiving a five million dollar grant from a character played by Bo and Yang, which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah. And the museum opening goes very well. And then that's when he decides to text his little ex-boyfriend. And then, of course, there's a scene where he runs to the museum to meet him. And Billy sings him a song. And they fall in, back in love and agree to be together. For three months. And, and, then, re and reconvene. Like, I guess that's supposed to be funny. The end. Okay. Should I just go through my notes? Yes. Billy, my first note is Billy Eichner makes me so uncomfortable. He just, he's loud. Every word of dialogue is like he's shouting it and then his posture. And then I don't know. I don't really know him that well except for Billy on the street. Which or, was annoying. Or I, I see him at Akbar quite often. Yeah. But he looks like he like tried to lose weight for this role because he's um, shirtless quite a bit. And he looks a little deflated. I just, he just, everything about him makes me so uncomfortable. And then he's one of those characters, like a character trait of his is that he is like living out loud and proud. So he's very aggressive. And I just think like, he's not very self-aware and it's just equally as cringy in real life. Being yes. around people like that yeah. is how I felt watching this movie. Well, yeah, it's like your uh, kind of over overcompensation for your confidence doesn't allow you to read the room. And I think also maybe in within the screenplay that he co-wrote with the director, it's just like you are such uh, it that it sucks the life out of any chemistry that's supposed to build between these two characters because because he's so. There, it's one thing to be difficult, but difficult people can still be lovable. Uh, I'm, and I'm not saying this person can't be lovable, but it's just, it's such a hard sell in this. That well, that's a note. Like, this romance is weak as hell because they have no chemistry. I don't know what either of them... I mean, I know why Billy's character likes Aunt Bobby, whatever, Aaron, because he's like your standard good-looking muscle guy. But why Aaron likes him, he does say, I like you because you're, like... You're the chaos I need, basically. You're so much different from everything else and so different from me. And but then... Aaron's character, they write him like he's kind of like an airhead. But he's not. He's like a probate lawyer. Like, he's clearly intelligent and accomplished. But then it's like he doesn't know a lot of references. And he's very insecure. And I, I don't know. The writing of that character to me was crunchy. I thought that Luke McFarlane did... He was fine to me. He had kind of like a Brad Pitt vibe a little bit. And it's... He's more easily... I liked him more than... Yeah, yeah, he's more easily likable. But, okay, so this is the first gay film, gay rom-com from a studio, which there's probably an insane amount of pressure that goes along with the marketing of that film this way and, and even getting it, you know, with, even with Judd Apatow producing it. Uh, but it's like you have such an opportunity. Why is it still filtered through this prism of just, like, this white gay male perspective? I... I, I it's you know it's clearly making fun of queer eye in this which uh, the first uh, series of that 20 years ago or so was doing the same thing it's always like this first wave thing we have to go through like the white gay male way and it's like this would have been such an uh, excellent way to discover like other really weird issues in the queer community like uh, racial fetishization or uh, all of the other kinds of power hierarchies that are going on that really could have grappled with. I did want to say that I'm sure there was a tremendous amount of pressure for these writers, having been given this opportunity to make this movie with this major studio, to check all the boxes. So I acknowledge that. But you can do, you could have still had your cake and eat it too, but not have just like this basic white romance. Well, I, like yeah, I mean, I, for, like an, another note is like, I feel like I'm just watching a movie about everything that like, you know, as me as a gay person, like all the things I hate about the gay community is like they made a movie about it. When I, really this should have been like a parody. And there's a scene, I'm I'm all over the place now, but there's a scene where Aaron asks Billy, Bobby, if he wants to have like spend Christmas with his family mm -hmm. for the first time. 
in New York City and like Billy can show the family around. And there's a scene where they go to some like cabaret or show tunes type restaurant. It's very gay. And there's a confrontation between Billy's character and Aaron's mom. Like it's very passive aggressive and they're talking about like how gay kids should be raised. I thought that vibe was what this movie should have been. Yeah. Like, it, like if you want to make a point, you got... Because this is a... At the core of this movie, it's an adult comedy. So I'm not trying to act like this is supposed to be a serious movie that bat- tackles all the issues. I wanted this to be funny. So... And it is in many moments. But I think it needed to be more of like a parody and not just like, let me show you what's like shitty about the gay community and then have a main character who kind of exemplifies all of that. And then like says this that self-loathing, delusional person who has every opportunity and all the things, but just wants more, even though you're not likable. It's just boring. I, like I, I see that all the time every day in real life. It's just not fun to watch. But, and I think maybe had Bobby's character been cast with someone else, I would have liked this movie more. Well, because Bobby feels very much like Eichner himself, from what I know of his I mean, I don't know that lady, but yeah. From his professional persona that I am aware of, it feels very much like him. And every now and then, there was a moment, there was a line, there was a, a look that was like, oh, this is very Woody Allen to me in, in, in New York. And I wish that if it had been a little more, better curated, a little more, uh, it, it is self-aware, but a little more uh, willing to critique itself i think this could have been like the woody allen neurosis as a gay man but the movie opens with billy's character being told like we want to offer you like he can write a movie but make it so that straight people like it and then he's like so what am i supposed to do like i thought that the the bit they were doing in the opening i assumed that i would get something different but i got exactly what i didn't want which is like just playing on all the tropes I feel like the movie Fire Island, mm-hmm. which to me feels, I, I don't know, I thought that movie is much better at presenting a component of gay life that I think was relatable, but very specific. This feels so broad. It is very broad. That, I, you know, okay, so another reason why I think for someone like me, this movie caught my attention. It was not because it's a studio, Judd Apatow, Billy Eichner. It's because of some of the supporting cast, mm-hmm. like T.S. Madison, Ms. Lawrence, um, Simone, the, a drag queen who recently won RuPaul's Drag Race. That's what caught my attention. They're in the movie, but I feel like their placement is very like strategic. Gr- gratuitous, like, or strategic is the better word, because... Um, Billy Eichner's running this museum that's trying to open and he has like his like panel of people who are assisting him and so they're made up of like T.S. Madison, Miss Lawrence, um, a lesbian, this man who keeps saying he's bisexual and then a trans woman. That just felt like we got to check the boxes. Then Billy's character's like friend group is like there's like a trans man in there, several many black people, like then there's like a throuple and it's just like it's trying to do all the things. But I don't believe that that character Billy's playing would have this friend group. I feel like he would have the Fire Island like, oh, I'm like a semi-famous guy and so I can have these like more attractive friends that I'm going to surround myself with he would not have that friend group. And then even in the scenes where we see him with his friend group, he's just dominating. Mm-hmm. So it's like you really don't give a shit about these people then. So I don't believe that these would actually be your character's friends. And then when we see you with them, you're just dominated. Right. I don't see any loyalty to those yeah. people. That It's not, you know, something out of Larry Kramer that I, that I see going on there. Um, it, it, did, it does one thing once, and I wrote down Family Guy, and I'm glad I didn't keep doing that, was when uh, Simone is the third part of this thruple with his friend group that we're introduced to, and they have this fantasy sequence, like, what are you going to call your parents and say, I'm, da- I'm uh, having sex with another person? That was funny. Yeah, it, I was like, I'm glad I didn't keep doing that, though. Sure. That's what Family Guy does. Keep sure. going off in yes. fantasies of whatever it's mentioning. I did write that as a funny moment. There's another, the party where Billy Eichner's character meets Aaron uh, is for it's like a party to support this app called I Zellweger. Did like, I did like that. Like Renee Zellweger and the app is like it's like supposed to be like Grinder or Scruff except it's like guys who want to talk about actresses and like then go call, to bed. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was cute but I don't know I thought the acting was stiff from many characters. The audio is inter- it seems like there's a lot of like 
like vocal work that was done after it was shot. Probably, yeah. That, and I don't know if it had to do with like Billy Eichner seems like he's just shouting everything. Mm -hmm. So maybe they had to re-record other actors to match the volume of. I, I don't know. To me, it sounded weird. I don't. I I do appreciate seeing like oh like contemporary what contem contemporary hookup cult culture looks like and how kind of like soul deadening it is with uh, like his interactions with some men from Grinder and 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 how like rude and inconsiderate people are. But then all of those scenes, uh, I don't know. Again, he seems like I don't know. It's just like his character is just also seems like an asshole. Yes. So I yes. don't care that people don't like you or that they are dismissive of your feelings. Um, and, and they have all of these notable uh, gay actors playing straight roles, like Guillermo Diaz and, and Jay Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yeah, which, which, which is interesting, and then I think there's a point there to be made, but then it, he also makes a point, uh, more than one occasion to double down on like these straight, white, cis guys playing gay cowboys, and there's a movie that they go to that's supposed to be a lot like Brokeback Mountain. It's like, okay, sure, but Brokeback Mountain was also very first wavy where we have these gay white men that are straight playing these cowboys and opening all these doors. And I think the bitter irony about something like Bros is in not so many years, we're going to look back on this and have the same complaints. I think the people who made this movie thought they were doing something like progressive and like moving the needle forward. And to me, it just seems kind of like, it, uh, again, it's just like kind of everything as a, Gay black man, everything I don't like about the gay community is what this movie was to me. It's, but it's not like satirical. It's like for real. Because in the end, these two think that they are right for each other. And you can reference as many Meg Ryan movies as you want. Like, But it, it's those also are archaic as well uh, in how we deal with romance. But uh, what did you think about the sex scene with... Um, between... Uh, well, the only Aaron. note I have for that is like, I don't know that I've seen a movie where someone's using poppers, except like maybe like a gay indie gay film. Gay indie films, yeah. But like for a mainstream movie to see like a, a character use poppers, I thought that was amusing. Interesting. I'll, but the way that they're... But the sex scene is shot so weird. Like they're both, like it's just... Well, it's... Well, there's more than one sex scene. One of his grander hookups, it's like they, they're, they're not naked and then they just kind of tussle around and then ejaculate and then it just feels very... It, it doesn't feel very adult. It's certainly not sexy. No. Um, no, it, it... And equivalent rated R adult comedies, they push the envelope further with the sex scenes. I agree. The so scene this... where they're hitting each other uh, is reminding me of uh, My Stepmother's an Alien, where Kim Basinger's the alien learning how to have sex, and she's learning it through animals hitting each other. <laughs> oh. Uh, but that, as the title indicates, and as that scene is key, uh, is, is talking about kind of like toxic masculinity in the queer community and how overcoming that has, uh, you know, hobbled a lot of men, especially of a certain generation. And I don't know, to me, it's just like, we, we sh that, that sure, that's something that still needs to be addressed, but there are so many other things that are more pervasive and more troubling. And, and uh, th like, like that is something that could have been easily dealt with uh, in passing even I, I don't know then something that billy's character feels is that aaron only likes other like muscly white guys and so he doesn't find him attractive so at a point he decides to start taking steroids and then we get like a little sort of it's not even a montage but it's like we get a segment where billy is taking steroids and he's going to the gym and it doesn't amount to anything he doesn't well, it does. He has a sex scene with a, a there is a, a black man. There is a moment in the gym where, for it just seems so random. Like he decides he's gonna. Act. The other thing is the title of this movie, Bros, makes it. I thought this was gonna be about like masculinity versus you know like in within the gay like mass it, mass culture, and I don't think it is. It well, no, it's. I think that's pervading the whole scenario with Aaron. Aaron is. As the audience, we see that he presents more masculine, but that's not really something that is talked about. It's not like Billy's character keeps saying, oh, you're so mask and I'm so femme. It, it's just like inherent that we see. But then we do get this scene at the gym when Billy's on steroids and then he sees this black man like lifting weights. And then Billy decides to like be mask and like approach this guy and the guy decides to hook up with the ham. But then while they're in bed, Billy uses his normal voice and the guy gets freaked out. But not because he's not masculine, but because he was pretending to be someone else. I thought that was, like, awkward, but in the right direction. Again, I just wanted this to be a parody. Like, maybe this character adopts a different persona. 
And I know people are going to complain because I just, maybe I'm just tired of gay white men, but it just would have been so much more interesting to focus on someone else. And if you wanted to make it more provocative, maybe, maybe feature like a Latino man who can pass for white and all the intricacies of, you know, all the things he experiences. All, was, the, all the things everybody says every day. Right. Like, like that would have been sexually interested. That, that could have been really like a dark comedy and it, it, that could have really pushed the envelope. But I, I guess America's not ready for that from a studio um, uh, it, it just feels so funny to me it's just like oh like our future representation is on Billy Eichner's shoulders it's how this film is being marketed which annoys me okay so the Hallmark channel in this movie they call it the Hall Heart channel and I thought something that was funny is we get a lot of movie titles that was funny. of movies that are played on the Hall Heart channel and I can't recall any of them Holly Polly Christmas but but it's supposed to be like this Hall Heart channel now that like be, like the LGBT community is like popular mm -hmm. they're capitalizing so they're making all these movies appealing to the community and they have names like yeah like threesomes and Polly and anal stuff I but thought that was it, funny wasn't one Christmas with either yeah so I did think that was funny um Something else that did not work for me is the final, the end of the movie, it, it all, you know, culminates with this museum opening and Billy's character, because he runs the museum, is t talking to all the people and thanking them and explaining what the museum is. And then that's when Aaron walks in to reclaim his love. And then Billy's character decides like, oh, this is when I want to sing a love song I wrote to you. In the tradition of Garth Brooks. Oh, I just thought that that was so like, well, why would this be the place? And why would these people care? Also, <laughs> just like moments prior, he told one of his besties, uh, I forget her name, the woman that's married to Guillermo Diaz in the film with the children, uh, that he wrote a song for this man, but he's never, he don't, don't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. But yet... He has rehearsed this, He's song, rehearsed this song with all of his co-workers because they are like the band playing it. Again, I know this is supposed to be a comedy, but it's not farcical enough for me. Like, it it just, I don't know. And it, and it doesn't feel endearing or sincere. It just feels like this central character being loud and obnoxious and uncomfortable and really unlikable. And I don't care. I, I, I didn't want Aaron to be with him. I thought Aaron could do better. Aaron seemed like a sweet guy. I think <laughs> if Billy Eichner feels like someone that's beating us into submission, it's like, well, there will be a component of people that just don't like that. Because I know he's made comments about how he doesn't want a certain type of person to see this film, uh, i.e. its unintended audience, which reminds me a little bit of Lauren Hill. Uh, so we'll see how that works. But uh, The only other thing of note is uh, the very end, like, is what, after the museum's open, they're taking the tour. And Bowen Yang's character, who donated the $5 million, it was under the... Uh, sort of requirement that he could have like a haunted house ride within the museum which is funny uh, but also about gay trauma <laughs> but also um there aaron at one point had told billy like oh the museum's so boring why can't it be fun like the movie a night at the museum so then the final scene is like ben stiller amy schumer like all these notable people are like recreating a night in the museum as like a simulation i mean you know that was cool it was interesting. I, I think it's unfortunate that, you know, because I think ever since casting was announced, we we're like, oh, what's Simone going to be? What's, who's T.S. Madison going to be? And and then they're both pretty wasted, especially Simone. I, I think T.S. Madison, well, she has more to do and more lines. And I do like seeing her on screen. And I, I thought Miss Lawrence had I, a really good line. Miss Lawrence has a couple good moments, I think. Yeah. But, uh, but that's it. I, I don't know. It, Again, I thought like a lot of the uh, peripheral characters worked better for me. I would have liked to have seen a movie with them the the better movie to me would have been the board members of the museum like everyone but billy eichner and from their perspectives dealing with some that would have been the movie same everything the same except it's coming from everyone dealing with this white guy who thinks that like he represents the community when it's like you're the one who has of all of us the most privilege why are you speaking for us I would have loved the movie to be at, from everyone else's perspective yes. about him. And those moments also felt very much like Apatow's train wreck, where Amy Schumer's working at the magazine until the Swinton is the boss. Mm -hmm. And I thought those were all the best parts of that movie. Uh, and I did like the use of Deborah Messing. Oh, Deborah Messing is in the movie playing herself because she has made some comments about how she's like the Viola Davis of her time or something like that and of course there's a lot of backlash so her PR team thinks that maybe she can get out of this by giving a considerable donation to the museum so she meets with Billy Eichner and I thought she was very funny she gets mad at Billy because Billy's being obnoxious like he's in every other damn scene so 
I thought that was effective. And then we see her again at the end of the film, mm -hmm. like just very briefly. But that was fun. I thought that was fun, yes. Yeah. What would you give this movie? Two and a half. Okay, I didn't like this movie, but I can see people liking it. I would give it two and a half. Like, it's, oh, it's, I mean, it, it'll be fine for some people. And I can see some people thinking it's hilarious. But for my taste, no. I, you know, I hope it is a success because it will mean that we'll have more content at a certain level. And again, you know, in retrospect, we should probably be kinder towards, you know, first wave things, the first uh, gay studio film, rom-com, gay rom-com. But uh, I don't know. Ultimately, I think we can and will do better. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,